Hi folks, it is Wednesday the 14th of October and we're going to be starting um, again this evening our Bible study, or continuing our Bible study on Hebrews, going into Hebrews chapter 4 tonight. Uh, but just before we start, let us pause and pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that we have had. Thank you for your blessings upon us, for your provision, for your safety. Lord, just for your goodness, for being our God's who loves us and cares for us so much. Father, we, we thank you for your word, the Bible, and we thank you again that we can gather in this way to study your word together. We just pray that you would help us, you guide us in our thoughts and challenge us and encourage us now as we come to it. So Lord, thank you and be with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So folks, thanks for joining in. Um, we're on Hebrews chapter four tonight. Let me read to you the first 11 verses and then we'll see how we get on. This is God's word. God's promises, promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we, for only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, In my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. We know it is ready because of the place in scriptures where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. But in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first hear this good news fail to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set aside another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. God announced this through David's much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labours, just as God did after creating the worlds. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. That's the end of verse 11. Amen. It's again another interesting passage, um, connecting with what's already been said and then taking things a little bit further. It talks about God's promise of entering his rest still stands. For us, that talks about how um, judgment is not upon us yet, that there's still time to be able to choose to follow God, to turn to him uh, and to obey him and walk the way that he has called us to walk. It follows that off by saying we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. That's God's rest. You know, again, that shows that at the end of this life, at the, at the point whenever uh, God calls time in the world, that there is judgment. And there is that fact that some of us will be in heaven, some of us will not be in heaven. Uh, there, there is this misconception, um, this thought among some people that oh, we'll all get into heaven, doesn't matter. Um, we'll all get there eventually. Well, actually, again, this tells us that's not true. And as you read Revelation, you would see that as well, that there are two destinations. One is God's rest, which is heaven. And the other is to fail to experience that rest, which is hell. Uh, and that comes as a warning right at the very start of this chapter. Verse, says, for this, verse 2 says, For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. God wanted rest for his people all those years ago um, whenever he brought them out of Egypt. They had suffered much. They had been under persecution. They had been slaves to the Egyptians. And that went on for 400 years. And then God answered their prayers. They, they cried out to God, to, to, to save them, to rescue them. And he said to Moses to lead them out of Egypt and into the promised land. So that was there. 
but they missed it. God time and time again said to them um, to follow him, to, to listen to him, to obey him, but they go their own way and in the end they are punished or they are judged. They missed getting to God's rest. And the author writes here, for this good news that God has prepared a rest has been announced to, to us just as it was to them. That was the rest that God announced to them. I, you will be my people, you will be blessed, I will look after you, just follow me, obey me, listen to me. But they turned their backs. We have a similar call in the Bible about obeying God, following God, so that we can have that rest, so that we can have a place in heaven. Think of John 14, what Jesus said about in my father's house are many rooms or many mansions. You know, if we don't listen to God and listen to Jesus, then we miss that. And that's what the author is talking about here. It says further on in verse 2, But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. The people didn't, later life, didn't believe God. He said he wanted to be their God. He said he wanted to guide them and look after them and protect them. He showed them a land where they'd be blessed. But yet they turned to idols. They asked um, Aaron to make them a golden calf. They brought idols out of Egypt with them as well. They turned their backs on God. They didn't trust him. They didn't have faith in him. And it's the same today. You know, you can follow all the good works of the day. You can do everything the way you feel that you're meant to. Um, you, can, you can love neighbours. You can show consideration for others. You can be really good. You can give back. Uh, you can do all the right things, but without faith, it means nothing. Without faith, um, it is useless. Faith is what makes the difference. Trust, and faith is simply trusting God, letting him into your life and, and giving him his proper place. That's what the Israelites lacked. Yes, they, they, they went through and they followed all the rituals. They followed um, the feasts and all as they were told to, they brought sacrifices, but they didn't trust, they didn't believe. And, and the writer here is calling us to believe in God uh, as saviour, to believe in God as who he is, believe in what Jesus has done for us. Verse three again carries another warning. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine not entering that place of rest? That verse is taken from Psalm 95 verse 11. Um, and it comes as a, as a warning. Again, it talks about God's anger. That's judgment. Um, what will happen? It says, even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. You know, God made the world to be a place where we could live with him, um, where we could enjoy his creation and we're part of that creation uh, and where we could worship him. But then we turn our backs and sin comes into the world and we miss it. It says there, we know it already because of the place in scripture where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Can you imagine God creating? Now, whether you believe in a literal six days of creation or whether you believe in six periods of time, that, that's okay. Just think of God creating. And it comes to the end of that time of creation and it says that God rested. Now, do you think God rested because he was tired? Do you think he rested because he was exhausted? That he, he needed to sleep and he needed to, to unwind for a while, the way we do? No, God's not like us. When you think of what God has done, you look outside the window and you see creation, you realise that God's so much more immense than us. So when it says that God rested, it's, it's that sense of enjoyment. It's that sense of, of, of sitting back and seeing what he had made and saying, this is good. And being able to, to have the, the enjoyment of that and also the sense that he wanted to enjoy the company of what he had created talks about God coming down to the garden um, and walking in the cool of the evening to see Adam and Eve. Now, whenever they had sinned, they had hidden from him. 
God calling out to them, where are you? God knew where they were. He knew what, he, what they'd done. But yet he still calls out to them. Just that sense of God wanting to be with us. You know, that, that's, that's incredible. And God's saying, you know, this was made for you to enjoy. Made for you to be able to, to benefit from this. To be able to pleasure in this. It says, but in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. As human beings, we squandered that rest. We wasted it. Because again, God creates us with free will. We have, we have that way of, we can choose. Do we follow God? Do we not? Do we do what, is, what we know is right, what is inbuilt in us to be right? Or do we go our own way? Uh, as Adam and Eve showed, they went their own way. They turned their back on God. They disobeyed what he had said, do not eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, or you will surely die. And Satan takes those words and twists them. And then as a result, you know, Eve takes the fruit, then she gives it to Adam and they eat it, and then sin enters the world. You know, it's sad. Uh, it, it is really sad what happens. And they miss God's company. They miss... God's presence, they miss God's rest. And things after that become difficult and hard. Yeah, I mean, lots of people will debate about, you know, what we were designed to live forever and when God says you will surely die, it means physically. No, I, I don't believe these bodies were made to last forever. But God created us with a soul that would dwell with him forever. And that sin created a barrier then, and that's the death it talks about. So we miss that chance of rest. But as this passage says, that by, by trusting, by believing in God, by letting him in, then we restore that relationship. Yes, we're still not perfect, but we can enjoy that rest. Verse 6 goes on to say, So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. The author, the writer, really wants us to understand about obeying God, following God, about the importance of that. So he goes back again and said, but the people who first had it, they turned their backs. So that's the Israelites, God's chosen people. The people through whom God said he would bless the rest of the world, um, they turned their back. He said, so God set another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. Again, that's encouraging. Again, that tells us judgment has not yet come. There is still time to turn to God, to trust him, to believe him, to be able to enter his rest and enjoy it. It says, God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. You know, we've heard those words before. They've been repeated from earlier on. Don't harden your hearts. Turn to God, let him in, follow him. If only we would do that. If only we would follow God, if only we would trust him. If only we believe. Our hearts are naturally hard at times. We want to reject God, we want to try and explain everything. And today we live in a world that tries to explain everything away. You know, we, we try to let science explain everything under the sun. One scholar wrote, um, science tells us how, but God tells us why. And also talks about how God created science. And yes, science is the outworking of how things happen, but God tells us why they happen. God tells us it's because he made us, because he loves us, because he has an order of things. That's why they happen. Science just tells us how that happens. He says, now if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest till to come. So there is a special rest waiting for the people of God. Now who do you think about when you think about the people of God? A special rest waiting for the people of God. Like before in the passage where the, the writer talked about being God's family, being sons and daughters of God, being brothers and sisters with Christ. That's what it means to follow God. It means being part of his family. So if you're listening to this, if you are a follower of Christ, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you're born again, whatever phrase you want to give yourself, 
You are God's family. You are the people of God. And, and he wants you to know that. He wants you to understand that and what it means. And he wants us to really strive to follow him. Because we have to still put in the effort. Even though we trust God, even though we have faith uh, and we follow him, that doesn't mean to say we, we say, All right, okay, God, you're in my life, now I'm going to go off and do my own thing. That's not what it's about. It's we let God in and then we let him transform us and change us. We, 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 we read his word. We seek for what it means to be a follower of Christ and, and how we can apply that to our lives every day. And it's about challenging ourselves every day. It's about challenging, how, how do I do that? Why do I do that? What should I do? What should I not do? And that's what being the people of God is all about. That's what striving towards that rest is all about. Let me read that again, verse 9. So there's a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labours, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. That's another warning again. You know, the people who are followers of Christ, who have died, who have passed away, they're enjoying that rest. They have rested from their labours just as God did after creating the world. They are with God. They know peace. They know healing. They, they know what it is to be in God's presence. They're enjoying that. And the author says, the writer says, let us be the same. Let us have that to look forward to. You know, don't miss it. But let's just trust him and know that he'll look after us. But know that if you disobey God, that then, yeah, you will fail, fall. You will fail. You'll miss it. Verse 12 goes on in this way. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. The word of God. So we think of the word of God as this, as the Bible. And that's very true. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. God's word is the sword, the sword of the spirit. When you think of the armour, as Paul talks about it, as he writes about it in the New Testament, and this is our one, in that armour, it's our one weapon of attack as opposed to a defensive or a bit of armour, a bit of protection. This is our attacking but we also have to see how that reflects on us and how it shows us. So God's word is alive and powerful. So this, this might have been written a number of years ago, uh, but it's still relevant to us today. It's still important to us today. It still shows us and instructs us about who God is, what he has done, why he has done it, how he wants us to follow him, how he wants us to live our lives day by day. And it should challenge us day by day as to how we do that. It says it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. This lays bare about really who we are. That even whenever we're followers of Christ, we still have a battle that goes on in, in us, inside us between good and evil. We still have to make those choices every day to follow God and not to follow our own sinful desires. And that's something that we will always battle until the day whenever we leave earth and go to be with God, because we're human, and that will always be there because we have got free will and choice built into us. God doesn't force us. He doesn't make us that we must follow him without any choice. We've got choice. So that's the hard part for us each day. It says nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Wow, he sees everything. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. You know, in this world that we live in, we've got laws and we've got rules. We've got the police who watch over us. Um, we've got the police who make sure we obey the laws. I mean, even something as simple as driving down the road, if you're speeding, you can be pulled in, you can get a ticket, you can get a fine, you can get points. If you go off and murder someone, you can expect to be pulled before the courts. 
You know, we, we've got accountability in everything. And it's the same with God for our, our whole life. Ultimately, God is the one who we are accountable to. God is the one who will judge us. That's why we are told in the Bible, we are warned in the Bible against judging each other. Warned against pointing a finger at somebody and saying, oh, look what they're doing. Because whenever we point the finger, there's more fingers pointing back at us. Because we are just as guilty when it comes to God's eyes as somebody else. None of us are perfect. So therefore, we can't judge others. We can't call them to account as such. Yes, we help each other. And if somebody, you know, we, we walk with each other and, and we try to encourage each other as much as possible. But when we do that, we need to remember that we are flawed as well. That's hard maybe sometimes. Maybe sometimes we don't want, to, don't want to think of ourselves as being flawed, as having faults. But if we're honest, we know that before we even get too far through our life. We realise just how bad we are. But again, we want to strive to live the best that we can. One day we will be able to give an account of ourselves. If we haven't trusted God, then we're going to be judged in that. If we have trusted God, then our judgment is taken away because we're covered by the blood of Christ. We have grace. But we still have to give an account of ourselves. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. God misses nothing. He is the one to whom we are accountable. That should stop us in our tracks. That should make us really sort of ponder about our daily lives. Make us wonder about how we live each day. You know, and... Yes, it's frightening. That's, that's, that's a holy fear. That's a reverent fear. That's what we talk about. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. But that's where we should begin. Actually realising who God is and having that respectful fear. And then seeing how we can live our lives for God. How we can follow him. How we can let him in to change us. You know, letting God into every aspect of our life is the key. It's not about just following on a Sunday, just doing what we think is right whenever we think others are watching as well as God is watching. But it's letting him into every single aspect, every corner, every nook and cranny of our lives. Whenever we do that, then we truly know blessing. We truly know what it means to be filled by God, by his spirits, to be led by him and to be challenged by him. And expect to be challenged, folks. Expect God to show you the parts of your life which are not right and him wanting to, 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 to put that right. Also, hand it over to him whenever you get it wrong. Don't beat yourself up. Realise that you will get it wrong, but then learn from that. It's a, it's a bit like, you know, if somebody doesn't know what fire is, the first time they put their hand in the fire and they get burnt, they soon realise very quickly not to do that again. That should be us within sin in our life. We should realise quite quickly, no, that's wrong, I shouldn't do that. And then we should steer away from it. That's what then steers us closer to God each day. Makes our lives more like him so that we can truly live for God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. Thank you for giving us your rest. Lord, Help us each day to do that, to live for you. Show us those aspects of our life which are wrong. And Lord, challenge us as to how that we can live properly for you, how we can live in a way which is pleasing to you. Lord, we know we'll get it wrong and we're sorry for whenever we get it wrong and we hand it over to you. Lord, help us not to beat ourselves up about that, but to learn from it and move forward so that we can grow closer to you each day. Lord, thank you. And go with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining with me tonight. Um, I'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Take care. God bless. Bye.